I'm Dr. John Harold uh, here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I have the honor of chairing the fourth late-breaking clinical trial session where we heard the results of four pivotal clinical trials focused on peripheral vascular disease and coronary disease. The discussants for our first two presentations are not here, but I'll give uh, just a, a brief overview. We heard the report of the secretory phospholipase A2 inhibition with verilospidib and cardiovascular events in patients with an acute coronary syndrome, results of the VISTA-16 study, which was presented by Stefan Nichols from Australia. Uh, this study looked at the, the possibility of an anti-inflammatory agent reducing uh, or improving outcomes in patients who present with acute coronary syndrome. This was essentially a negative trial. Uh, there were some issues with the uh, trial uh, producer with regards to uh, outcome reporting, which was delayed, and that was discussed by Dr. Nichols. But again, essentially a negative trial, which raises uh, some significant questions on this particular class of drugs for the future. The, se the, the second trial that was presented uh, was a randomized multicenter clinical trial of renal artery stenting in preventing cardiovascular and renal events, results of the CORAL study, which was presented by Christopher Cooper from Toledo, Ohio, in this study, uh, looking at renal artery uh, stenosis uh, and the role of peripheral angioplasty in patients treated with appropriate antihypertensives and statin therapy, failed to show any significant clinical benefit in patients who had uh, renal artery stenosis. Uh, the debate in that trial really had to do with the severity of the renal artery stenosis, how that was defined, and the hemodynamic consequences, and whether or not the more critical uh, lesions may have had more significant impact, but that's, that, that's a question that, will, that was un left unresolved. I'm pleased to present our two discussants uh, from that, uh, that presentation. Uh, our first discussant will be Dr. Harold Dar Dr. Darrowman from the University of Vermont, who will be uh, presenting the results from the STREAM trial, which is one-year mortality in STEMI patients, randomized to primary PCI or a pharmacoinvasive uh, uh, strategy. Uh, Dr. Darrowman. Thank you, John. So STREAM uh, is a randomized clinical trial performed primarily in Europe, where they randomized patients to early fibrinolysis, usually in the ambulance, followed by PCI done 6 to 24 hours after the fibrinolytic therapy, versus the conventional approach of picking up someone in the ambulance and bringing them directly for primary PCI. And the 30-day results were presented a year ago, and now we have the one-year results, which show similarity in cardiac mortality and overall mortality between the two strategies. STREAM was not powered as a superiority trial to show one strategy was better than the other, nor was it powered as a non-inferiority trial, so we can't use a standard statistical uh, definition of equivalence to say that the two arms are equal. But the way that the study was done, it does provide an option for early reperfusion re therapy in centers and regions where primary PCI is not an option. The harder question is whether it provides an opportunity to use pharmacoinvasive therapy in centers and regions that are already doing primary PCI, and I don't think the results necessarily support that without showing clear superiority of the pharmacoinvasive approach. If a group or a region can do primary PCI in a timely guideline-based fashion, 24 hours a day, I think that the uh, results of this trial won't alter that practice. I would like to note that the trial was done in an interesting manner where the DSMB changed the protocol after 20% of the patients were enrolled. And to the credit of the investigators, they did enroll elderly patients over the age of 75 and noted an increased risk of intracranial bleeding in the first 20% of patients enrolled in the pharmacoinvasive arm. They changed that dose to half-dose lytics in the elderly, and with that, you saw a dramatic decrease in intracranial bleeding. And I think this is an important safety observation that for those uh, centers and regions doing pharmacoinvasive therapy, it may be warranted to include that half-dose lytic strategy in the elderly as a way to prevent increased risk of intracranial bleeding. So Dr. Darman, uh, this has global implications. And in, in the type of lytic agent selected may be very relevant here. Can you comment on this the type of lytic agent that you, you would be, be focused on? Well, that's exactly right, John. Here in the United States, for the few patients who are a few regions doing pharmacoinvasive therapy, and I'd estimate that at less than 20% of U.S. STEMI patients, 
The most common fibrinolytic pattern is to use a fibrin-specific agent like TNK. On the other hand, the place where this may be a significant benefit pathway of pharmacoinvasive therapy is in countries that do not have the economic infrastructure to support primary PCI. And I think particularly of discussions we've had here at the American Heart Association meetings with the representatives from China and India and Latin America, where over 30 to 40 percent of patients get no reperfusion therapy for STEMI. But in those countries, due to economic reasons, reasons most of the STEMI patients are being treated with non-fibrin specific lytics like streptokinase, which if we go back 20 years were associated with increased re risk of both bleeding and abrupt closure of coronary vessels with early PCI. And so I would caution that the uh, application of the stream trial findings should probably be restricted to the use of fibrin specific lytic agents. And even as we expand into uh, economically challenged countries, I think that would be the mandate to use a fibrin specific lytic agent as part of the pharmacoinvasive strategy. I'm, I'm pleased to uh, present our next uh, trial, which is the randomized comparison of endovascular revascularization plus supervised exercise, exercise therapy versus supervised exercise therapy only in patients with peripheral artery disease and intermittent claudication, results of the endovascular revascularization and supervised exercise or ERACE trial. And our discussant today is Mary McDermott, uh, Dr. Mary McDermott from Northwestern, who will give us some uh, insights on this particular trial. Dr. McDermott. Yes, so the ERACE trial randomized 212 patients who had peripheral artery disease and intermittent claudication they were randomized either to supervised exercise therapy or to the combination of supervised exercise therapy plus endovascular revascularization. And the investigators measured treadmill walking performance and quality of life measures at one month after randomization, six months after randomization, and 12 months after randomization. At 12 month follow up, the group that got both revascularization plus supervised exercise had significantly better treadmill walking performance and better performance on several of the quality of life measures compared to the group that got supervised exercise alone. This suggests that perhaps the combination of revascularization plus supervised exercise may be better than supervised exercise alone, but a couple of points should be made. And one is that the magnitude of the benefit from the combined treatment diminished over time, so that at 12-month follow-up, the greater walking performance and quality of life in the group with both of the interventions was, as compared to the group that got exercise alone, was less than that observed at one month and at six month follow-up. So this suggests that perhaps with longer follow-up, it's possible that the supervised exercise treatment alone group might be doing as well as the group that got both supervised exercise and endovascular revascularization. Another important point about the ERACE trial is that the patients who received supervised exercise only got 43 exercise sessions on average during the course of the year of the trial, whereas clinical practice guidelines recommend three times of exercise per week or about 150 sessions per year. And both groups improved, even the group that got only supervised exercise. So this raises questions about whether perhaps less frequent supervised exercise may also be beneficial for patients with peripheral artery disease. And Dr. McDermott, this has payment implications in the United States because this type of activity is not routinely reimbursed. What are your recommendations for that? Right, so that's a very good point that John raises. Supervised treadmill exercise is not covered by most insurance companies, including Medicare, in the United States, even though it is, uh, it gets a um, high recommendation in clinical practice guidelines. And so what I tell my patients who don't have access to supervised exercise is to go out and walk for exercise on their own. Any activity that they can do, any exercise um, is likely to be more beneficial than no exercise at all. And actually, there are a couple of randomized trials on home-based exercise that have been published in the past couple of years suggesting that home-based exercise is beneficial as well for patients with PAD and claudication.
And Dr. McDermott, you talked about the six minute walk as an alternative m m modality, so if you can uh, yes. expand on that. Yes, yes, I'd like to discuss that. Um, most therapeutic trials for patients with peripheral artery disease and claudication use treadmill walking performance as the primary outcome measure, and the ERASE trial did that as well. The treadmill walking measurement was the only objective measure of walking that was used in the ERASE trial. But treadmill walking performance has limitations, and these include that it's not representative of walking activity in daily life. Many patients who are older, like those with PAD, have anxieties and difficulty and feel uncomfortable walking on the treadmill. So there's a significant learning effect on the treadmill that's observed. And on the other hand, the six minute walk, which is done in a corridor, better represents walking in daily life, has been shown to to be related to change, sig clinically meaningful change in six minute walk has been defined as measured by mobility loss in the community. So I would encourage all investigators studying new therapies for peripheral artery disease to use the six minute walk as one of their outcomes. And one last question, the decrement in activity over time in terms of performance, would you comment on what your observations were about that? Yes, so over time, the group, over time, the relative benefit of the group that got both revascularization and exercise diminished compared to the group that got supervised exercise alone, suggesting that with longer follow-up, the supervised exercise alone group may have caught up with the group that got both revascularization and supervised exercise. And this is consistent with what we know about these two interventions. With revascularization, there's immediate improvement, but then always the risk and um, the occurrence of restenosis over time. On the other hand, ex supervised exercise therapy improves walking performance, but it takes time. It usually takes about eight weeks before the patient realizes some benefit, and they've got to stick with the supervised exercise in, in order to continue improving their walking over time. So Dr. McDermott, the take-home message for the clinician on on the finding of the array study. All patients with PAD should get exercise. And for those who also get or have the opportunity for revascularization, they may get some short-term benefit um, compared to those who get only supervised exercise. So I want to thank the four clinical uh, trial participants for presenting some pivotal information that will help us in our daily clinical practice. And I want to thank everyone uh, from Dallas, Texas. And we look forward to uh, uh, future uh, outcomes and future trials. Uh, thank you and good evening.